Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. Today we're going to be starting a series of videos where we're going to be telling the story of the Awoken. This isn't a part of the video series where I cover the basics of Destiny, and it's also not a part of the lore from the Season of the Lost. The goal of this series is to lift the veil on what is probably some of the most important and fascinating lore in the entire game, which I didn't get to cover because I was burnt out back in Forsaken. This lore is going to be covering the whole story of the Awoken, as told through the Mara Senna, Awoken of the Reef, and Maraid lore books. Although the Maraid book, I think that's how it's pronounced? Uh, Mariad, maybe? Is actually not a lore book. It's a series of grimoire cards, and it goes over the events of the Reef War for what little part of it that we have. We'll also be finishing off this long series of videos with a raid lore video on the Last Wish raid, and an overview of the story of the Forsaken campaign, which of course is soon being vaulted. An ambitious schedule, perhaps, considering that I'm also planning on covering the rest of Clovis Bray's stuff and finishing off a bunch of other things in between, and we have four months to do this all. But four months is a long time, and I think that for sure we can get it done. First though, I wanted to talk about the sponsor of this video. Well, it's not actually a sponsor at all, no one's paid me to do any of this. The sponsor, oh, the person I'm shouting out this video, is my wife, aka the wonderfully talented Nerd and Needle. She worked super hard to launch her new store for all of her custom embroidered merchandise. She's going to sell some merch with a storefront that rotates every month. Each month is going to have topical and themed stuff that you can buy, and some of it may be to your liking. She's also very capable of taking any design you have and turning it into a patch, even if you only have a PNG. Although, if you do want to ask her about this service, you want to ask her and not me. This is the kind of thing which would be a special commission, but I don't know, maybe if you're a leader of a clan, or if you're a business looking to have your own patches done, you can get this sorted. Or maybe you're just looking for something like, say, a patch on a jacket that you would like. She can go ahead and do that for you. Point being, she is incredibly talented, and I'm very proud of her. And if you've got a moment, go ahead and check out her new store, see if there's something that you like. It'd be greatly appreciated. Now with all that being said, let's get back to the video. So, the story of the Awoken is one that introduces us to the characters of Mara, Aldrin, Sir Ido, and many other Awoken characters that we've not necessarily met in-game, but who've had a large influence on the story of Destiny through the lore that we're about to tell. Whether that includes Kelda Waj, or Osana Sov, or Alice Lee, the first Queen of the Awoken, all of these characters are involved in this story in one sense or another, and over the course of the series we're going to learn a bunch about how the Awoken came to look like the culture of reclusive space elves that we know today. However, to understand how that journey begins, we need to not begin with the Awoken, but with their human origins. In short, we need to talk once again briefly about the Exodus program. I feel like I've mentioned them so many times now that I must have sounded at some point like a broken record to someone out there, but for those of you that don't know, the Exodus program was a project that was organized in order to set up human colonization efforts out beyond the solar system. There is a ton of extra context on it that I don't think we need for this video, and maybe I should touch up on because I'm not sure if I ever have. I think I need to look back through the archives and see if I have a video on them specifically. If I do, maybe I'll link it in the end card. If not, let me know if that'd be something you'd be interested in. Either way, the point remains the same. Human colony ships were being sent out beyond the solar system, and this would be the origin of the Awoken. Typically speaking, each Exodus program vessel would hold about 50,000 or so people, including passengers and crew. One of these vessels, the Exodus Green, also known as Yang Le Wei, is where we start our story today. Now, there's a note that Yang Le Wei is linked to a certain project Amrita, which is mentioned continuously in the lore entries, and I'm not sure if it's ever specified somewhere if the lore of Project Amrita and the Exodus program is somehow intertwined, if maybe the Exodus program is the civilian and more military side of things, and if Project Amrita is instead the civilian arm. But either way, the Exodus program and Project Anrita are somewhat connected, I think. This is something that's not well defined though, and honestly, if we get more lore on it at a certain point, it'd be very good to know. The story of the Awoken starts with the Mara Senna book, the first part of our great epic. 
And alongside the first parts of the Awoken of the Reef lore book, it's divided into specific titled chapters. Today we're going to be looking at the first of these, Rephos, which defines and explains the earliest days of the Awoken when they were human. It also gives us our first glimpse into Marasov before she was the regal queen that we know today, and in a strange way, I feel like if you're going to pay attention to any of the lore entries in this series, this first series of entries in Brefos is the one that you should really pay the most attention to, and maybe that'll become clear as we go on, but I think the reason for that is simply because it seems as though even in these early days, the actions and things mentioned in these early entries chart out how the rest of the story for the Awoken is going to really pan out. It shows you the early trajectory of characters like Mara Solve and Alice Lee, and Osana Solve, Mara's mother, and even Aldwin, who of course would later become Aldrin. It even tells us a little bit more about the potential for characters like Sir Ido, I think, although that last one is an assumption, although I think it's a very fair one to make. Either way, our story begins in the depths of space. Like this. The woman sits on a ledge that overhangs infinity. She looks down and kicks her legs. The stars shine brilliant here, because the sun is only fractionally bigger than the rest of them. Sol lies almost perfectly below her. Of course, up and down are defined only by the thrust axis of Yang Liwei. Upward, the black umbrella of the shield and the matter storage, and the docked ships that make Yang Liwei not just a mothership, but an entire traveling fleet. Down below, along the slim spine of the ship, the shielded bulb of the engine glows invisibly infrared. If she slips off this ledge, she will fall down the ship's length at one-third of an Earth gravity. Not because there is anything pulling her, but because the ship is pulling away. Yang Luwei is accelerating, slowly but inexorably, toward the stars. She is of no single race or ancestry, and the light on her skin is the color of starlight. She drifts with her suit tinted clear so she can soak it up. She was 19 years and 9 months old at the moment the ship began its transstellar injection burn, although this is true only if you count by the calendar of a planet she has barely visited, but will always love. She thinks you cannot help but love Earth if you grow up in space. You love Earth the way all adolescents secretly adore two century old video of Nai Nai and Ye Ye dancing on New Year's Eve. Earth does not ask too much. The colonies are demanding parents, but Earth is like a chill old grandma, simmering in weird art and weirder ideas, enthroned upon ecology older than human time. Earth was the first terraformed world. Life made Earth livable. She is going with Yang Liwei and the rest of Project Amrita to make new worlds. She came because she saw an omen in a man's death. She was on EVA with him, repairing a jammed radiator fin on an uncrewed Circumjovian platform. They worked in companionable silence, listening to the howl of the Jovian magnetosphere when it happened. A frozen rabbit embryo came out of deep space at 40 kilometers per second and went through his faceplate. The rabbit must have spilled in a biocontainer accident far from the sun to plunge back inward like a comet. Immediately afterward, for reasons very clear to her because she had always had a sense for the meaning of things, reasons very difficult to explain to others because she has always felt this sense was secret, she asked her mother if the family could travel with Project Amrita. Amrita. The drink that endeth drinking. The bottomless cup. It is the quest to spread far beyond the solar system, and to end human dependence on the Traveler. It calls to those who see humanity as a cocoon, an instar, a form ready to be shed. She is an Ortage Third Class, a self-motivating subsystem of the ship's inclusive ecology, a term that spans technology, biology, and behavior, all of which must be maintained for the mission to succeed. Her task is to locate problems and report them to an Autage Second Class, who will give her the tools she needs to repair them. But she never speaks to her Second. She never tells anyone about the problems she finds. Instead, she fixes them. Her work has therefore assumed a magical quality. She appears where there is trouble, and shortly afterward, the trouble goes away. 
People have begun to leave gifts for her. Some of these gifts are questions. She answers the questions with a quiet confidence some would argue she has not earned. She knows she sees more of their lives than they see of hers, and that this mystery, this seeing without being seen, grants her a kind of power that is like wisdom. She lives outside the ship, suited and cocooned in a layer of cytogel, which keeps her surgically clean. She misses the wild zero-gravity fashions of her upbringing, clothes like drifting jellyfish that squirm away from snags, self-correcting darts in the fabric, silk like cool spilled alcohol. She misses the sense of oil and sweat on her skin, for the suit leaves her so clean that she feels skinned raw. Still, she stays out here because she wants to feel the changing taste of starlight, as the universe ahead blue shifts. As Yang Liwei accelerates towards light speed, it moves faster and faster into the light coming from ahead. If light were like dust, it would strike Yang faster, but light can never change speed, so it gains energy instead. Red light is low energy, and blue-violet light is high energy, so the universe becomes blue. Even now, the very tip of the visual spectrum, violet-blue light, is shifting into invisible ultraviolet, the color of speed, the color of the future. This woman, this third-class Ortage, with an affinity for starlight, would one day become one of the most powerful beings in all of Sol. But here and now, in her younger age, she would still hold the name by which she would one day be known, feared, loved, and respected. Mara Sov. She and her family journeyed aboard the Yang Liwei with a great purpose in mind. Perhaps Mara and the organizers of the Exodus program and Amrita project understood the importance of leaving humanity in a place where they were not dependent on the Traveler and therefore weakened even as it had uplifted us. Despite this, I think it would be fair to say that in many ways Mara would be alone. Perhaps the few exceptions to this rule would be her family. Osana Solve, her mother, and Aldwin, her brother, who later would come to be known as Aldrin. Our introduction to him traces a path that he will tread many times and in many lives, tangling with the wrath of a warrior who would conquer him, or at very least, threaten him and his life. Mara! the fighter shouts, delighted, and a punch shuts him concussively up. It's a really good hit. A thunderous uppercut to the point of the jaw. Mara hears his teeth grind across each other, down into lip flesh and shredded gums. She cringes in silent sympathy. He loses his grip on the equipment rack and tumbles out into zero gravity in a big arc of blood. His opponent goes for the coup de grace, kicks off hard and catches him in the stomach like a human torpedo. They plunge together toward the kill zone painted on the floor. Oldwin grins messily at Mara over his opponent's shoulder. He's fighting a big, brutal woman from Gravity Ops, a woman who's had her myostatin genes knocked out so she can swell up into a giant plug of brawn. Oldwin doesn't have a chance. He took the fight for the same reason he wanted to join the Amrita expedition. He measures himself by the bravery of his losses, by what he can survive losing. He applies a blood choke. It's the right move, but it doesn't matter. The woman groans, greys out, and goes limp, but Aldwin can't get out from beneath her sheer inertia before he hits the kill zone. The bell goes off. Aldwin groans as his rail-hard body forcibly decelerates his opponent's entire mass. Events have built up momentum, and he is just in the way. What did you lose? Mara asks him. He lies there panting and grinning, shedding perfect round spheres of blood. It's good to see you inside. What brought you? She and her fraternal twin never answer each other's questions directly. Mara is cool with this because she feels like words are a very bad system of encryption, and that if you really want to communicate with someone, you must develop your own special one-to-one -one crypto system. The ideal statement, Mara feels, would be indecipherable to anyone but the person it's spoken to, and even then, only if they know you are the one speaking. I got you some pictures she says, pushing the big woman off him, eliciting a fuzzy, Oh, hi, Mara. Full Simsorian captures. You can trade them for the parts I need. 
Oldwyn helps the big woman pull herself vertical, but his eyes are narrow on Mara. Not because he's sore at the idea of helping her. He's always liked bartering, bargaining, the hustle, but because he knows what kind of black market wants these captures. How far off the hull did you take them? How far off? All the way. They are in zero gravity because Yang Luei shut off its engines for an inspection cycle. So while Aldwin got in prize fights, Mara kicked off Yang Luei's forward shield and coasted 10 kilometers into pure void, tethered only by a thread-thin molecular line. She ordered her suit's cytogel to gather around her face. Then, only then, she overrode every sanity system in her soft suit and commanded it to retract into storage mode. Suit peeled away like rind, and she was drifting in hard vacuum. The void boiled the water off her skin. Her body swelled with unchecked pressure until her undersuit forced it to stop. Alarmed cytogel crawled down her throat, hissing emergency oxygen, not enough. Her skin blued with cyanosis. She was bathed in the most profound emptiness. She recorded all of it at the neural level. The exquisite darkness. The sense of fatal independence from all things. There are those who will give anything to feel that void. You can't keep doing this, Aldwin complains, as the big woman stares at Mara in awe. Mama is going to die of worry. I don't quite know what to make of Mara's drive and willingness to take herself to the controlled edge of death to accomplish what she wishes. I think it works as an adequate reflection of the kind of ruler that she will become, though. She takes huge risks willingly if she knows that she can win, and if she knows that what she can win will advance her cause. This, of course, would later be displayed with her actions that she took in helping us to defeat the Taken King, Oryx, where she would literally willingly sacrifice herself and many of her people for our cause, knowing that through her throne world, Eleusinia, she would be able to return. It isn't explicitly mentioned, but the description of the woman Aldwin was fighting makes me wonder if this is the first canonical mention of the woman that would one day become Mara's true lover, Sir Ido, the first Queen's Wrath. It certainly fits her description as a remarkably tall woman, and I do believe that the fight she's having with Aldwin is a parallel to the later battles and confrontation that Aldrin and Crow will have with many a Queen's Wrath under many a circumstances. The language in this, from her fuzzily saying, Oh, hi, Mara, to the larger woman literally staring at Mara in awe, also indicates that even here and now, before they are awoken and whilst they're still human, there is at least some degree of fascination and awe with Mara, which is something that is very much repeated later in the story of Mara Sov and Sir Ido, and if nothing else, is shown to be expanded upon as... Sieur allows her true feelings to shine through. There is, of course, another key character in this story that we've not touched on yet, and that is Mara's mother, Osana, that Aldwin was mentioning. Needless to say, a mother will swiftly learn of the misconduct of her children. For Mara, this includes the actions that arise from her many captures of near-death experiences, and those captures created a cult-like following of sorts. And so it was, that Osana reported Mara's actions to the captain of the Yang Luwei when she discovered them, Captain Alice Lee, someone who Mara wishes to one day become. It's in this moment that we start to see the most revealing idea of what Mara's relationship is like with her mother, and we also get to see the future that Mara will ultimately dictate with the Awoken of high status, whether they should be her mother, a greatly revered oracle of her people, or whether it is Alice Lee, who will one day become the first queen of the Awoken. I really don't care what risks you take, Mara's mother sighs. That's the deal we made, my little yellow star. Mum, Mara protests. My discarded tube of sealant, my sweet little fleck of paint. Osana likes to compare Mara to small pestilent items that drift near spacecraft, like crystals of frozen urine. As far as Mara can tell, Osana is the apex of a centuries-long project to create the ultimate embarrassing mum. She's also very blunt. Mara, even when you were little, you wanted me to treat you like an adult. So I have. But you remember what I told you, don't you? If you don't want to be my daughter, I can't watch over you like a mother would. 
I can't put you first like a mother would. I will always be your friend, but I have to make my own choices too. That doesn't mean you had to tell the captain. They walk shoulder to shoulder down the companionway to Captain Lee's wardroom. Mara keeps trying to get a step ahead, to lead, but Osana somehow matches her every time. Of course I did, Osana says. You started a cult, Mara. If I didn't say something to the captain, Behavior would have had this conversation with you instead. Do you want that? I didn't do anything. People liked my captures. People left me presents, spare parts, tips. Then Aldwin got into it, and you know how he is. Don't! Osana wheels on her. For shame, Mara. You know your brother will follow anywhere you lead. You know he's not capable of the same... Uh, her lips twitch. Imperial remove. You knew he'd brag about you living on the hull, and you let him do it. It is one thing to have a particular power over people, Mara, but it is another to deny that you are using it. Mara thinks she can come up with a stinging retort, given a few more paces, but it's too late. The hatch to Captain Lee's wardroom swings open. Mara is terrified of this place. This is where Captain Alice Lee, divine presence in Mara's life, interfaces with the officers who are the manifestations of her will. Since Mara wants to be Alice Lee someday, the wardroom makes Mara feel like she is a usurper princess, scoping out her rival's court. Captain Lee offers them tea. Mara cannot imagine the ways in which she is butchering what must be an intricate and meaningful tea ceremony. Lee serves some very battered pre-traveler ceramics sloshing with hot green tea, then immediately adulterates her own cup with milk from the cow thing on the biodeck. Revolting, isn't it? She smiles at Mara's bewildered horror. You should have seen what I put in my tea when I was camping in Mongolia. I understand your colleague, who is also your mother, has some concerns about your relationship with the rest of the crew. My darling Mara, Osana says, has, entirely by accident I'm sure, cultivated a reputation as a minor divinity. Her captures from outside the ship are hot items for barter. People draw fan art. There are tips left for her. You take captures while EVA, sometimes without a suit, Lee nods. Yes, I've played one. A remarkable sensation. This makes Mara grin impetuously. Mara, you're an autage, a volunteer. I cannot order you to stop, and your work is exemplary. Are you putting anyone else in danger with your art projects? No, Mara says. Just myself. False, Lee barks. That is a selfish answer. You are now a symbol to my crew, a house god. If you were to die, they would lose something important, something human that they have created out of loneliness and void. It would be an unforgettable reminder of the hostile nothingness that surrounds us. When you endanger yourself, you endanger that symbol. You are a part of this mission's behavioral armor, Mara. Mara is thunderstruck. She never thought about it this way. All I did was take some captures. I didn't ask to be anyone's mascot. You presented yourself as a conduit to secret knowledge, Captain Lee counters. People made something out of you, Mara. Please take this from a starship captain. What people make of you, what they create of you, even without your consent, becomes a kind of responsibility. If the Mara they see when they look at you is good for them, then you have some duty to be that Mara. She looks to Asana. What about your boy? He's in medical more often than any of the other underground fighters. It does not surprise Mara that Captain Lee knows about the fights. My son, Osana says, is determined to be his own worst enemy. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Of course, Lee studies them coolly. I keep an ear out for curious personalities. People who might be suited to long-term isolation while the rest of us are in cryo. People who awaken when others sleep. It's strange to see in this small series of three interactions that the shape of the story of the Awoken is already being told and unfolded before our very eyes. Remember these moments because you're going to see parallels to them throughout the rest of our tale. Whether it's Aldwin's fight with the woman, Mara's seemingly magical qualities, the fact that people interpret and follow her like she's a deity, the fact that she feels like a usurping queen around the captain, and even the fact that her mother, Asana Sov, sees through everything she does with perfect clarity. With this, this is the stage of our story, and it is set. The characters are in place, 
and they now walk towards destiny. Mara and the rest of the crew of the Yangla Way will travel into the depths of space, and in that darkness, something will find them. Something will change them forever. But that's all from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, go ahead and let me know down below in the comments section. Of course, if you want more Destiny content, you can also hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. And of course, if you enjoyed, remember to leave a like. It's something that will help this series out. I hope it's something that you're all going to enjoy, because let me tell you, this is a fascinating story, and it will go on for many strange twists and turns. Some of them you can already predict, and for those of you that know the story well, I hope that my ability to retell it is up to par. It's a very powerful tale, and I hope that I tell it right. In the meantime, though, know that as per usual, your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife, Herodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.